could be one or one. Definitely good to be out with you all. Uh, it was definitely an encouraging afternoon uh, seeing everyone that was there um, at the, the library annex and um, had a lot of good food there. I didn't get to um, partake of all of it. As a matter of fact, um, there at the end, some of the Chinese food um, was, I was wanting to get a sample of it. It was already taken, it was already gone. So I didn't get a chance at it. Um, but everything that I that I had and the family had, I didn't hear any complaints. Uh, so it was really good and a lot of good, um, good conversations that I got to have. I didn't get the chance to talk with everyone, but looking forward to having more conversations uh, like the ones we had today. Um, tonight, you'll turn with me in your Old Testaments to Psalm 11. This is where the lesson will be taken from. Before we dive into it, you know, the have faith in the Lord. And we've been talking about faith a little bit, I think. And one of the things that we need to look at and, and kind of recognize is the world that we live in. And how, you know, maybe from our own experience, you know, I think, I, you know, think back, you know, I used to not be able to say back in my day, but anymore I can say back in my day, things were different. And the older that I get, I know the more I'm going to get to say that. But we look back in my day and versus what it is today. And versus, you know, how many people, we're talking about gospel meetings and the announcements, how many people get to attend those gospel meetings? Some people don't have gospel meetings anymore. They just, they're, they're not able to. Some places, their gospel meetings are no longer week-long events. And I know, and I've heard stories that they weren't just week-long events. They used to be longer than that. And then they were short down to week-long events. And now it's it's like a weekend thing or, or three days. And, you know, like I said, you're lucky sometimes if the congregations even get to have a gospel meeting. And then we also look secularly and we see the world is changing in, in as far as the events and, and, you know, killings are new to us, but the commonplace of them now, it seems that almost every other time you're turning on the TV, you're hearing of some other shooting that happened that took place and several lives were lost, several others injured. Uh, you see the in schools, you know, we're concerned about our children in schools and, and what our children are learning as they're there, what, what's what's happening inside those walls. And, you know, we have some teachers here that help and try their best to make sure that, you know, God isn't forsaken, but there's a big push to remove them from the school system. And there's a bigger push, it seems now, to have classes and, and, and inclusivity and, you know, talking about uh, transgender and, and their pronouns and, and all of these different things that are being included pretty much into the curriculum. It's like that's one of their things is that they want these things to be implemented so that by the time that a child goes through school, they can come out on the other end and know how to identify and, and, and navigate pronouns. And in place of, you know, you know, maybe reading, writing, arithmetic, you know, some of those things that schools ought to be teaching and we get concerned about uh, those things and, and we find ourselves wondering sometimes where is god in all of this is this not a christian nation and we take polls and we see okay well polls that are taken at least 80 percent or so of people believe in god but then you take a similar poll and say okay well what god do you believe in do you believe in the god of the bible and it becomes less than 50 percent of people believe that the God that they believe in is the God in the Bible. And so we get concerned and we, and we worry about our, you know, our futures. We worry about the futures, the generations to come. And so this can be some a burden that we have and it can, it can weigh us down. And so tonight I hope that we can, we're still going to be concerned, I'm sure, and we're still going to do our best but we need to put our faith in the Lord. Throughout all of these things, throughout all of our concerns, ultimately, we need to put our faith in the Lord. And so the, this passage that we're going to be talking about, Psalm 11, you'll turn with me there. We're going to read the first few verses here. It says, In the Lord I put my trust. How can you say to my soul, flee as a bird to your mountain? For look, the wicked bend their bow. They make ready their arrow on the string. 
that they may shoot secretly at the upright in the heart. If the foundations are destroyed, what can the righteous do? So we're talking about foundations here in America. Are we concerned about it? If the foundations of the values that have been shifting and changing over time are destroyed, you know, we, we often talk about how this country was established with a lot of, was based on principles and morals from God. If those things are destroyed, what are the righteous going to do? We need to reestablish them. We need to remember, though, this. We need to remember the believer's security. You know, if you look at this, uh, this passage, fleeing to the mountains that they did, there is a, a particular sect of the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees. Um, I'm going to read this from the reference because I'm terrible at, at remembering this stuff. But the uh, Essenes was, uh, they, they were part of the, the, one of those sects of the, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. And it was believed that perhaps even John the Baptist may have been kind of part with this. But what they did was they actually would move into the mountains. They did not like the fact that the Romans were coming in and that they were changing all of the, the different uh, traditions that they had. They, they, they wanted to remove themselves from that situation. So they got out of town. They packed up and they moved up into the mountains. They said, I will, will be no part of this. And so they, they packed up everything that they had. And they moved into the mountains to remove themselves from that situation because they were worried about the traditions changing. They were worried about all of those things, the, the, the foundations, the values changing. They were worried about that. And so they removed themselves from that situation, got away from it. I would love to do that. You know, there's times where, you know, I think, you know, let's, let's, let's turn back the clock. Let's, let's do, you know, those... Uh, well, the, the wagons, the you know, start the wagons, and you know, you know, go out. Let's just start our own thing up again. Let's do it all over again, and and we'll have a, a good thing. But you know, that's that's where we started with America, right? We, we wanted religious freedoms. We wanted to try to get back to God. A few other reasons, but watching that movie, I don't know if anybody watched that horror movie back in the day, uh, The Village. Anybody show of hands know what I'm talking about? Well, that's basically what they did. You know, they, they got out of town. They got away from civilization. And they came up with all kinds of rules and, and uh, created their own scare tactic monster to keep everybody inside as well. And, you know, throughout the movie, as the some of the individuals broke free, got past the walls, got past the monster and everything, they, they see planes flying around, they see civilization. <laughs> it's like... What, what kind of craziness was I involved in? And so we understand that we are to be part of this world, right? You know, we're in this world, but we're not to be, I guess I'm saying that wrong. We are in this world, but we're not to be part of this world. We're to have a change of heart. We're to be different than the rest of the people. Not in a sense of we're going to start our own little, you know, encampment. And, and we're going to move into the mountains, or we're going to start our own village, or we're going to do something along those lines. But instead, we're going to trust in the Lord. We're going to have faith in the Lord. We're going to allow him to change us in a way that separates separates us from everyone else in this world. And we understand that going to, to Matthew, you'll turn with me there, Matthew chapter 5. Verses 13 through 16, that we are still to go out into the world. You know, how are we to how are we to uh, do the mission, do the work of the Lord if we seclude ourselves? So we understand that we still have to be the salt of the earth. Uh, starting verse 13, it says, You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is then good for nothing but to be thrown out, trampled underfoot by men. You are the light of the world. A city that is set on earth cannot be hidden. Nor do they light a lamp and put it under a basket on a light, a light stand, that it gives light to all those who are in the house. Let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. We cannot seclude ourselves from everyone else out there in the world. And we understand also this, that Christianity does not necessarily need a favorable 
uh, environment in which to thrive. We, we talked about the martyrdom a few weeks ago, right? That was during the times when Christianity was spreading the fastest, when people's belief in God was, was probably stronger. I mean, I, I can't say stronger than ever, but it was, it was very strong to the point where people were dying, literally dying for their faith, right? So we understand that. We can see in history and we can know that Christianity doesn't necessarily need this favorable environment to thrive. What about today? Do we, do we need the, the, you know, all Christian, do we need a favorable environment now? Yes, it is blessed to have peace. So there's a good thing that we have peace and we have, you know, religious freedom. We have the right to be able to assemble here tonight without fear of persecution. But in those days, they feared persecution and they thrived. They endured persecution and they thrived. So we know that we don't need a favorable environment necessarily. And if we look at Matthew chapter 7, just turn the page over, where it talks about the wide gate, the narrow gate. This is something that shouldn't be new to us. This isn't a novel idea. Matthew chapter 7, verses 13, it says, Enter by the narrow gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leads to destruction, and there are many who go in by it. Because narrow is the gate, and difficult is the way which leads to light, and there are few who can find it. So by this, we understand that there are going to be few that find the way. There will be few that are able to, to, to enter in on that narrow gate. This is narrow. There will always be a majority that go and take the path that leads to destruction. This isn't something that's new to us. And if you turn in, in back to your Old Testaments, to, to Habakkuk, this is a prophet who, who watched and prayed to God and was like just shaking his head at what he saw. And he prayed to God, and, and you know, this this his prayer to God was was this. He said, How how can I look at all of this? How can I see all of these things that are taking place? The unrighteousness of your people, God. And do you not see this? Do you not see this? And, and why are you not taking action on this? There we go. Like, where can I, where's this book at? <laughs> but God finally answers him. And he says to him, he, he's, he's saying, listen, you're not going to believe. You're not going to believe it, what, I, what I'm going to tell you. But I'm, you're, you're going to be just completely confounded by this. I'm raising up an army, the Chaldeans. They're going to come. And they're going to. They're going to. They're going to take take care of this for me. They're going to conquer you. They're going to, they're going to take hold of you. They're going to be lives lost. I will punish the wicked. And he comes back a second time to him. He's like, hold on, but why are you raising up a, a wicked army, an even more wicked army? To, to do your righteousness, to do your work for you. These are even, um, even more wicked people. That doesn't even make sense to me, God. How is it that you're going to do this? We see in the back of chapter 3, though, verses 16 through 19. It says, when I heard, my body trembled, my lips quivered at the voice, rottenness entered my bones, and I trembled in myself, that I might rest in the day of trouble. When he comes up to the people, he will invade them with his truths. And though a fig tree may not blossom, nor fruit be on the vines, though all the labor of all may fail, and the fields yield no food, Though the flock may be cut off from the fold, and there be no herd in the stalls, yet I will rejoice in the Lord. I will joy in the God of my salvation. The Lord is the Lord God is my strength. He will make my feet like deer's feet, and He will make me walk on my high heel on my high hills. Even though. This was what was taking place, even though he was told, 
that there's going to be an evil nation conquering you to fulfill God's righteousness of, of punishing his people. He's saying, I'm still going to take care of them. They're not, they're not just going to be used in this fashion and get away with their wickedness. But you can't get away with your wickedness either. But learning all of that and knowing the troubled times that will come upon us, he still is putting his faith in God. He's rejoicing in the Lord. God is his strength. He's going to take care of of those that put their faith in him. Next thing is that we need to remember the sovereignty of God. Let's turn back to Psalm 11. And we'll pick back up at verse 4. <clears throat> it says, The Lord is in his holy temple. The Lord's throne is in heaven. His eyes behold, his eyelids test the sons of men. The Lord tests the righteous. But the wicked and the one who loves violence, his soul hates. Upon the wicked he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, and a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. For the Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. What we need to take from this is that God is still on his throne. And we may look out in this world, in our own nation, and say, how so? The evil that we see, people, you know, and, and it's so commonplace now that marriage has been just pushed aside, that people just, they move in with each other and they live with each other as if they're married, but they're not. And they call that good. And people, you know, again, going back to some of these other things, you know, the transgenderism and the, the forced of acceptance and, and the homosexuality is rampant. And all of these things, and we can look into the Old Testament and see that sins of this nature were utterly destroyed by God. With Sodom and Gomorrah, utterly destroyed. And, and we look at this and we're like, how is God still on his throne if all of these evil, and that's just within our own borders. And then you start looking out at other nations and you see the troubles that other people have to face as well. We have to remember this, that God is on his throne, regardless of what may be, we might, might see and we might be thinking. God is on his throne. Let's take a, a passage out of Hebrews and look at that. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. says, you have put all things in subjection under his feet. For in that he put all he put all in subjection under him. He left nothing that is not under him. But now we do not yet see all the things put under him. But when Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death, crowned with, uh, with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, might taste death forever. We see that God put all things in subjection under Christ's feet. And so while all things may be subject to Jesus, we don't see their, their subjection. We don't see that yet. It's kind of like a backing, right? And how he didn't understand. He's like, how, how in the world is it that all these things are in, in subjection to you, God, when there's all this unrighteousness? And then you're telling me that the unrighteousness of this other people is also your, your handiwork and that you're, you're bringing them in to, to do your work as well. For us, it, it's, it doesn't make sense necessarily. And even then they say, you know, that they, they looked out and they still saw that. You know, we look out there and we see unrighteous people prosper. We look out there and we see, you know, so many people that are completely against God and their, their lives seem to be thriving, in a sense. How is it that they're doing so well when they're in complete opposition against God? Well, God will still judge them, right? God is still going to judge them. We just don't see it yet. 
What's going to take place in the last day? We just talked about judgment day last week. What will take place on that last day? All will be judged. All will be brought to their need. All will be forced to confess and be in subjection to God, to Christ. All on that last day, the day of judgment, will be forced to acknowledge him. Atheists and all. Murderers and all. John sees what's being done. In verse 5, Psalm 11, the Lord tests the righteous, the wicked one who loves violence, his soul hates. He still sees all these things that are being done. He sees it, and it will, he will take care of it. It will be judged. There will be a judgment. And in the last day, justice will prevail. Verses 6 and 7, on the wicked ones, he will rain coals, fire and brimstone, a burning wind shall be the portion of their cup. The Lord is righteous. He loves righteousness. His countenance beholds the upright. We will see God in his glory. I think we are righteous. Justice will prevail in our last day. We might not, you know, we might look out again and, and be discouraged. But in those days where you feel like you're being discouraged, where you feel like, you know, all is lost, where you feel like, why, why, do, why do we go through this? Why do we do this? I encourage you to turn back to Psalm 11. Remember this psalm. Turn back to the psalm and give it a read. Maybe even turn to back, you can see it too. But the Lord is not slack concerning his promises. He is the same yesterday and today and will always be the same. And he is ultimately righteous. He, he, he is the embodiment of righteousness. And so we know since he loves righteousness and, and that his countenance beholds the upright, that if we are at heart, and if we maintain this righteousness as well, if we come to him through Christ, that we behold his countenance. So in conclusion, what, what are we to do when we feel like the foundations are destroyed as is listed there? When we think the foundations are completely destroyed, what can the righteous do? Um, the same thing with them is done. We need to persevere. We need to endure it. We need to be faithful to the Lord. There was several times where the apostles were attacked for no good reason, no reason other than the fact that they were even just proclaiming the gospel message, right? And what did they do? They probably had every right to, to go out and stir up the crowds and, and say, come on, let's let's vote out this mayor, let's put somebody else in, but let's kick these people out and let's try to do something better. Maybe even have, have some sort of a lawsuit. You know, we've got a claim. We, we, we should be able to win this. But instead, what did they do? They prayed. They got together, encouraged one another, sang songs of praise to God, prayed to God, and put their faith in Him. They prayed for boldness, prayed for wisdom, they prayed for strength. And we need to do the same and navigate ourselves and our families through this perverse, crooked, unjust, unrighteous world. All the while, sprinkling some salt, shedding some light to those that are around us. This life can be tough. And if you find yourself outside of God's light, if you find yourself in the, 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 the way of the wicked, you can come to God tonight. If you have put on Christ in baptism, but are finding your, 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 your faith in the Lord shaken and need prayers of encouragement, don't hesitate to ask us to pray with you, to pray for you. Whatever your need may be, don't hesitate, don't wait. Please take action. Take a seat on the front. Let us help you in whatever way we can as we stand and sing the invitation.